When I was about 13 years old, my younger brother Jeff and I became very sick one fall, that fall. It started out what seemingly looked like flu for Jeff and that he couldn't shake it. It continued for about a week and then about another week went by and I came down with the same symptoms. And so my parents attributed whatever I had to whatever Jeff had and just kept us home from school and waited for it to all pass. But then another week went by and Jeff and I were not getting any better. And mom and dad began to get very worried, especially after Jeff spiked a very high fever for a better part of the day and began to hallucinate. As I remember it, they took us to our family doctor and he recommended that we be put in the hospital so that the doctors could determine what the problem might be since we weren't getting better. The only good thing that happened in the hospital was that Jeff and I were put in the same room. After a number of tests and examinations, the hospital was equally stumped in what could be the cause of our illness. And at this point, my parents were increasingly beside themselves. Jeff and I weren't getting any better. In fact, Jeff was getting worse. We had been anointed. The church was praying for us. My parents spent every spare moment at the hospital with us, with us but why weren't we getting any better? Uh, why weren't the doctors even able to determine what the problem was? We had been sick for so long and it was getting so bad that Jeff and I couldn't even stand on our own anymore. We'd lost so much strength. The best diagnosis that the doctors could come up with was that we had some sort of blood and or kidney problem, but they had no idea what course of action to take. The low point came one night at the local hospital about a week or so after we had been admitted, and I don't remember the reason now, but that day the doctors had determined that they were going to give Jeff a blood transfusion. It didn't make any sense, even looking back on it at the time, because we weren't losing any blood. So those of you that are familiar with engines, if you overfill an engine with oil, you have problems. For some reason that night I couldn't sleep, for some reason. I remember being in a great deal of pain and discomfort, feeling sorry for myself. I eventually called the nurse, asking if I could be given some sort of pain medicine or sleeping pill. She looked at my chart, this is back when they still hung them on the end of the bed. She looked at my chart and informed me she couldn't give me anything without doctor's authorization. So I laid there for some time, continuing to feel sorry for myself, and finally I started to drift off to sleep. But it was around that time, in that haze of quasi-sleep, that I began to hear a strange sound. And it persisted. I became more aware of the room as I woke up a little bit more and realized that the sound was coming from Jeff. I looked at him, he was contorted on his side in the bed, um, and knew something terrible was happening, and realized as I woke up even more that the sound was him choking. He was choking on his own tongue. My mind raced, I jumped out of bed, now bear in mind I hadn't walked on my own unaided for a couple of weeks, jumped out of bed knowing I needed to find someone who could help, and I thought to myself, as I started running, how good it felt to be able to get up and move on my own. We were so young at that time that when we were put in the hospital, we were put in the pediatric wing of the hospital, the floor, and all of this was happening somewhere around one or two o'clock in the morning. So there was minimal staff available. And I remember sort of running, walking down the hallway, looking for someone to help. And as I passed the nursery, I caught a glimpse of a nurse feeding the baby. And I went in and informed her what was going on. And very quickly, there were a number of people in our room working on Jeff. The next morning after Jeff was stabilized, both of us were moved by our parents to Children's Hospital in Cincinnati. I would venture to say that all of us have probably dealt with some form of illness at some point in our life and probably some form of serious illness. And it's a sad note, uh, even as I recounted today, that it seems not a week goes by without receiving prayer requests on behalf of people with some serious illnesses that they're facing. And so today I'm going to talk about divine healing. Divine healing. Why is there so much illness in the church, in the world around us? Is it manifested only because of some sin that's committed? What's the balance to be struck between seeking medical help and faith in God to heal us? And how does faith even fit in with all of that? So what should we consider 
when we ask God for healing. I'd like to begin in Exodus 15 because I want to begin, as we discuss this topic, with the acknowledgement, first and foremost, that God is our healer. God is the one who created this life that we have. He is the one that sustains it. He certainly knows how it functions and when it doesn't function, what isn't operating properly. And he made a promise to Israel as they were leaving Egypt, Exodus 15 and verse 26. He tells them here, if you diligently heed the voice of the eternal your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all of his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians. And there were some pretty awful things that he did, doesn't there? But he says, I am the eternal who hears you. And in the Hebrew, that expression, the eternal who hears you, is Yahweh Rapha. And it literally means the healing God. I am the healing God. If we move over a few chapters to Exodus 23, and verse 26, he reiterates this promise. Twenty-three, verse twenty-five. I'm sorry. He says, "So shall you serve the eternal your God, and He will bless your bread and your water, and will take sickness away from the midst of you." David wrote in Psalm thirty, verse two. He says that you have healed me. He understood that as well. But let's look next at Matthew chapter four. Do we recognize that God is our healer? It might seem an obvious statement to make, but we can oftentimes forget it. We live in a time when there's great advancement in medical science, a great deal of knowledge and understanding that has advanced in the last 20 years even. But in Matthew chapter 4, we also have here record of how Christ healed. In verse 23, it says, And Jesus went about all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. We'll come back to this here in a moment, but I've always found it a curious thing how much, how extensive that was during the time of Christ, and how in many ways it's reflected in the world around us now. It just seems like there isn't a family I know that doesn't deal with something, some major thing. Um, Let's look at the example in 2 Kings of Hezekiah. This is a great example to remember because God answered Hezekiah's prayer in such a powerful way. 2 Kings chapter 20, we have the account here after the Assyrian armies had come up against Israel and Hezekiah did the right thing because he didn't know what to do and he'd gone to God and he asked for intervention on God, for God to intervene rather. And yet, in spite of that, there was bad news that Hezekiah received. So, 2 Kings 20 and verse 1, it says, In those days Hezekiah was sick and near unto death, something so serious he was going to die. Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him, God had sent him, and says, Thus says the Eternal, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. I think that's the definition of a bad day if you would hear that expression. It's not anything anybody wants to hear, is it? And after all that Hezekiah had done, Hezekiah was one of the better kings that Judah had had. And so yet he gets this news, and you can imagine how he feels. So in verse 2, he turns his face towards the wall and prayed to the Eternal, saying, Remember now, o Eternal, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what was good in your sight. And he wept bitterly. So how long would that sermon or that prayer be? It's just a few seconds, isn't it? But it was so heartfelt that God listened to it. And so verse 4, as it happened before Isaiah had gone out to the middle of the court, Isaiah had delivered the news to Hezekiah that he was going to die, and then he left. He's walking, and he's not even out of the, the, uh, the palace yet. And God speaks to him and says, return, verse 5, and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the eternal, the God of David your father, I have heard your prayer. I've seen your tears. Surely I will heal you. And I can only imagine how happy Hezekiah was to hear that. But God goes on here 
Hezekiah was of such the right heart that God adds to this. And so then he tells him, on the third day you shall go up to the house of the eternal. Not only am I going to heal you, I'm going to heal you quickly, he says. Because Hezekiah being sick would not have had access to the temple. He could not have gone and offered sacrifices. He would have been cut off at this point from going before God. And God tells him, you're going to be well enough in three days that you can come before me. Verse 6 then, he says, I will add to your days. He even goes beyond here. He says, I will add to your days 15 years. This is after God told him initially that you're going to die. But now he tells him, I'll give you 15 more years. He says, and I will deliver you in this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city for my own name's sake and for the sake of my servant David. And then Isaiah said, take a lump of figs, Isaiah says to Hezekiah. And so they took it and they laid it on the boil and he recovered. Some sort of infection that God had allowed through this boil that was so bad that it was, would have killed Hezekiah. But this is a powerful example, isn't it? We wish every prayer could be answered this way when we go before God for healing. Let's move next to Isaiah 53. And let's consider how we can have this healing as God promises. In Isaiah, we have a series of prophecies here regarding Christ. And we know, in hindsight, how they apply to Christ. But there's an important point to remember in reading this because we have insight here in terms of even this healing that we might request from time to time. So in Isaiah 53 and verse 3, Isaiah writes here, he says, Surely he, speaking of the Messiah to come, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him as stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. And this is certainly what Christ went through, wasn't it? We speak of this and many times read of this section in Scripture around Passover. We're reminded of what Christ did in coming and dying for us, that we can have access now to God's Holy Spirit, that we can begin to be converted and come, become like God. So verse 5, to continue, he says, But he was wounded for our transgressions, our sins. He was bruised for our iniquities when we violate God's instruction. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Now, we can look at this physically, and we can. But we know that this also applies more importantly spiritually, doesn't it? Is it more important to have a body that's not dealing with whatever illness or disease, or is it more important to have a mind healed that will respond and become like God? I'm not taking one away from the other, but oftentimes I'll quote this when someone comes to me for anointing. This is a promise that God has made, that in, in addition to Christ dying for our sins so that we can have eternal life or the access to it, that we can also go before God, the very throne of the universe, and ask for physical healing. Peter repeats this very similar statement in 2 Peter 2, verses 20 to 24. He reminds us again that by his stripes we are healed. Do we believe that? There's a component of faith that I'll come back to here in a moment in the sermon that we need to remember. Do we have faith to be healed? Do we have faith that God is the healer? It's amazing and revealed knowledge. It's amazing how much money is spent just in this country on medical expenses. People will give everything they have in order to feel good, to be healed to have a life worth living. And there's value in that, as we heard even in the sermonette, to have a life, to live, to enjoy. But we also know that this life is not the be-all, end-all either, is it? Um, does it mean, then, that all illness comes from sin? It's one of the questions I ask. No, it does not. So let's consider a little bit of logic here. If that was the case, then why isn't the whole world in grips of some type of serious sickness or illness? There are people doing some very awful things out there, violating God's instruction in the life they live, and yet oftentimes they seem to be immune to some of these consequences. If we say as well that it's because, that is, the world doesn't face these things, it's because God is not working with the world now, then 
why isn't the whole church of God facing some type of illness? Because if we know better and we still commit sin, then why aren't all of us dealing with something? The argument of illness equaling sin is flawed. It's not right. Sometimes illness is from sin, broken physical laws. I mentioned in previous sermons my great uncle, who was a lifer in the Air Force and smoked like a freight train. By the time he died, he only had part of one lung left. They kept cutting out pieces of his lung because he had lung cancer. He wouldn't give up smoking, couldn't. That was a consequence of a physical law that he broke. There are consequences of spiritual laws, and sometimes illness is for those reasons, and sometimes it's for other reasons. To go back to the story of my brother and I, that after that very scary night, I thought I was better. As the doctors and nurses worked on my brother, I was in the waiting room. They had me out of the room. I thought I was good to go. I had gotten up and run down the hallway. I felt like I had not felt in a long time. But I didn't realize that it was just the adrenaline that had kicked in. Um, an hour or so after the incident, as I sat there in that waiting room, as I tried to get up, I realized I couldn't. All that strength had left me as quickly as it had come. Uh, my parents were even more so beside themselves at this point. Now, it wasn't just a matter of us both being sick. My brother had almost died. If I had not been there, he probably would have. What do you say to someone going through a trial like that? I consider that as I go to hospitals sometimes and people are dealing with some very serious things. I've asked myself, how do I answer them? What kind of comfort do I give them? The pastor that was dealing with my parents knew what they had done. They had sought his advice. They had sought anointing. He knew that they were looking to God to intervene. Everything that they should have been doing, but nothing was getting better. It was getting worse, actually. I asked my mom a couple of decades after that. We were talking about various things and reminiscing, and this story came up. And I asked her what the pastor said to them at that point. I was surprised at this because I had not heard it before this time. He essentially told them that maybe our healing was not going to be at that time and that they should consider that God might let Jeff and me die. We read what God said to Hezekiah. Nobody wants to hear that. But the reality seemed to make that scenario a very real possibility. What was God trying to show them and teach them and would it mean that Jeff and I would no longer be alive. Everything about that illness tested my parents, they said, on a level that it had never been tested on before. Among other things, as it was related to me later, it tested their faith, not in God, but on a more fundamental level of whether they would put us before him. If they would, like Abraham with Isaac, if they would follow through, whether it would cost a life or not. Because what had my brother and I done that we would be stricken with such a debilitating illness? Much later, personally, reflecting on that period in my life, there's much that I've learned from that period of when I was so sick. But I still believe that that trial was mostly for my parents. But nonetheless, it was a defining moment in my life. I've pondered many things from that time, things that I've learned and considered and still think about from time to time. Let's go next to Matthew 9. There is a component, as we've already touched on, that illness can come from sin. We even see this in many times Christ healed. And in Matthew 9, we have one such example. And the Pharisees or the Sadducees took Christ to task because the way he said this. They didn't stop to consider that he was speaking this way because he could. They simply saw it or heard it as blasphemy. So Matthew 9 and verse 1, it says, As he got in a boat, he crossed over the, the sea there, came to his own city, and then, behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed, a man that could not walk on his own. So his friends carry him to Christ. And when Jesus saw their faith, their commitment, I mean, they carried this guy. However far a distance it was, it doesn't say here. They wanted their friend healed so badly that they carried him to Christ. He was impressed by their faith, and he, so he says to the man that was paralyzed, Be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. Now, we're not told what those sins were, and it doesn't matter. 
they brought him, their friend, to Christ in faith, asking for healing, and he said yes. The scribes then take exception with this, and they say this man blasphemes. And if Christ was just a man, it would be, wouldn't it? I can't forgive sin. You can't forgive sin. But Christ said that very clearly in verse 2. So in verse 4, he knows their thoughts, and he says, Why are you thinking such evil in your heart? You would think they would be at least a little impressed that this man is healed. But they were fixated on the wrong thing. So Christ asks them rhetorical questions here. He says, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise and walk? What's the difference? The net result is the same, isn't it? The man is healed. But he explains in verse 6, that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sin. He turns to the paralytic again and says, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. So he did both, didn't he? He covered them on both And so in verse 7, the man arose and he departed. In this case, there was sin involved. And again, we're not told what it was. But Christ forgave the sin and healed the man. There are many other examples of this in Scripture, where he heals someone. The woman that was even brought in adultery, even though it wasn't a healing, he told her, go and sin no more. There can be that component. But let's go to Psalm 103 and see that this is also part of what God promises in healing if there is sin involved. Psalm 103, and in verse 3, David here writes, speaking of God, who forgives all your iniquities. He forgives our sins. We know that. Again, we rehearse that in the holy days, especially Passover and unleavened bread. We ask God for that on a regular basis to be forgiven. He says he does that. He forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. Now, part of the difficulty is that we're caught up in the world around us, aren't we? We breathe the same air, we drink the same water, we eat the same food that everybody else has access to. And it's all compromised, isn't it? We can't diminish that as much as we would want to. We can try to eat healthy, and there's value in doing that. I'm not saying we shouldn't, but we can't control so much of that, can we? God here promises as well that even if there is sin involved, that he will heal our diseases. Psalm 107. Psalm 107, and in verse 17 says, Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. There are times when people do things and they cause their own problems. That even applies to illness. You eat the wrong diet for 15, 20 years, you're going to have problems. You don't take care of yourself and you engage in risky behavior. You're going to have things happen. Um, There is a component of this, but it's not always the case and we have to be careful. Um, Verse 19, they cried out to the Eternal in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. So even if we do something foolish, verse 17, if we fit that category, God still says that when we cry out to him that he will save us out of our distress. And so verse 20, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. And then notice what should happen. Verse 20, oh, that men would give thanks to the eternal for his goodness. It's interesting when you look at history, and especially major events like the Black Plague. That event was truly, I won't say life-altering. It was not just for one person, but it changed cultures. It changed governments. It changed history because so many people died in that. And it didn't have to be. Why did the Black Plague spread so quickly through Europe? Because they had horrible sanitation and hygiene principles. They would take their chamber pots. If you don't know what that is, you can look it up later. (laughs) And they would empty it into the street in the morning. Dead bodies wouldn't be taken care of. Food would be out and exposed to flies and all sorts of things. And so when those rats came into Europe on the ships that had gone to the Far East, 
and they brought that disease on the fleas, it spread very quickly. The one area that did not have the same impact that the rest of the culture did was the Jewish communities because they followed quarantine, they followed health laws, hygiene laws that God told them to back in Leviticus. Illness can come from sin, but sometimes it doesn't come from sin. So let's look at John chapter 9 next. We have a very powerful example here of a man that was born blind. What's really interesting about what Christ does here is that an individual that's born blind, their brain rewires. It essentially says, okay, this area of the brain that normally is for visual processing, and, and most of what we see, what we think we see, is actually what the brain processes. Well, if you don't have that input, then the brain says, okay, I'll use that for something else. And it gets reassigned. And even if they're able to have sight later on, it's not sight like you and I have. The brain doesn't know how to process the information. So John here uh, records this event as Christ passed by. Verse 1, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples, notice what they said, they asked him, Teacher, who sent this man or his parents that he was born blind? This was the common accepted perspective that if somebody had such a major thing like this, blindness, while it's not an illness or a disease, it, it, the body's not where it needs to be, right? Not the way God designed it. Something wrong has happened here. And the expectation was somebody sinned. And so they ask him the question very innocently, but he answers them simply, neither this man nor his parents sinned. This is not about sin, he said, which probably shocked them. Notice what he says. The reason the man was born blind was so that the works of God should be revealed in him. Now, there's a lot not recorded in Scripture, and at times things that I would love to know. What did this blind man think of this? He's sitting there. He's hearing this. Wait, you're telling me that this is not sin, that this was so that God could show his glory in me? What did he think of that? We have no idea. We don't know right away. We know from what happened later. He was extremely impressed and thankful for this. But verse 4, Christ said, I must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. And as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And so then after he said these things, he took some spit with the ground, made some clay. He anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And so he went and he did, and he came back seeing. Can you imagine how excited he was? <laughs> how receptive he was to this? He was so excited he became a problem to the Pharisees and they kicked him out of the temple. <laughs> but did Christ heal him or did that poultice heal him? Why did Christ put that clay on the man's eyes and tell him to go wash? I can only assume that he wanted to see if the man would follow through on this. And he did. He went and washed as he was told. He gained his sight. Notice in verse 37, though, this man comes back to him. He wants to know who healed him. Because remember, he was blind when this all happened. Right? He couldn't pick this guy out in a crowd. So he comes to Christ because Christ had heard that he had been kicked out of the temple. And so it says, when the man found him in verse 35, Christ said to him, do you believe in the Son of God? This man was extremely happy of what would happen. And he responded, like we read back in Psalms. Yes, he wanted to give thanks to God. And he answered and he says, who is he that I may believe in him? And Christ, I can only imagine him sort of gesturing to himself. <laughs> um, you have both seen him and it is he who is talking to. It's me. And so he says in verse 38, to answer the question in verse 35, he says, Lord, I believe. Do you believe in the Son of God? Yes, I believe. And he worshiped him. And so then Christ uses this as a teaching moment. He says, for judgment I have come into this world that those who do not see may see, and those that see may be made blind. And of course there are Pharisees around. And so they asked, thinking they knew, and thinking they knew better than Christ, they asked the question, are we blind as well? They didn't get the answer that they wanted to. 
Christ answered in verse 41 and said, If you were blind, you would have no sin. You wouldn't know any better. Meaning spiritually blind. He says, But now you say we see, therefore your sin remains. Illness doesn't have to involve sin. We have the example in Luke 9 of, let's read that, and of the young boy that had a demon. Luke 9, and we'll begin in verse 37. I've often found it very curious, if I've said this already, I'll repeat it, that there was so much illness in the culture when Christ was alive. And yet we don't see much different now, do we? There always seems to be a brokenness, even, even in health, as mankind rejects God's instruction. But in Luke 9, verse 37, we have this example, and it says, As it happened on the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, this was after the transfiguration, a great multitude met him, and suddenly a man from the multitude cried out, saying, Teacher, I implore you, look on my son, for he is my only child. This is a man desperate. He's not embarrassed to say this in public. He's not holding it back that I'll wait until he's by himself or a convenient time or whatever. He's going to seize the moment here, and he's, he's begging Christ. He says, Behold, verse 39, a spirit seizes him and suddenly cries out, and it convulses him so that he foams at the mouth, and it departs from him with great difficulty, bruising him. So I employed your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. There is an element in asking for God, no matter what the situation is, when we come to him for healing, to have a level of persistence. This man was persistent. He went to the disciples, and he says they couldn't cast this demon out. And so Christ answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. And as he was still coming, the demon threw him down and convulsed him, and Christ rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. And I can, again, only imagine how overwhelmed the father would have been to see his child no longer having to go through this. But here we find that it didn't involve sin. It involved a possession. Something led to that. We're not told what, but a very young boy. Again, what would the circumstances have to be? But nonetheless, Christ resolved the situation, healed in this way, this boy, the Probably the most powerful example we have in Scripture is of Job. And in chapter 2, as Satan comes before God, and God almost lays down a gauntlet, doesn't he? Have you considered my servant Job? And Satan says, well, yes, but, you know, you protect him, and you bless him, and he does all these things because of what you give him. But then God says, well, I don't think that's the case, but go ahead and try. What's, what, was, what was Job's sin? We're not told there was any sin there. In fact, in verse 3 of chapter 2, God tells Satan that Job was perfect and upright, a man who eschews evil. We don't use that word very often. That means avoids it, goes out of his way to not be near it. This was God saying this, and if God was not telling the truth, I can bet you a dollar to donut Satan would have called him out on it. And yet, he didn't. So why did Job go through all that? Well, we're told in chapter 42, God wanted Job to see something. He couldn't. He was stuck spiritually. And so he allowed Satan to do what he did because God knew that he could use that. When you're really sick, you ponder life in a different way. You consider things differently. And God can use that, and he did with Job. And Job got to the point where he said, I finally see God. Now I know. But what medicine, what poultice, what could Job have done to remove all those painful boils? Do you ever have a boil? I had one, one time. Job's body was covered in boils. I can only imagine the pain and discomfort he was in. We even have the example in 2 Corinthians 16, let's look at that, of, of Paul relating of this, what he called, thorn in the flesh. 
2 Corinthians 12, if I misspoke, apologize. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 6. Paul here recognized something. We're not told exactly what this thorn in the flesh is. I'll come back to that in a moment. But he realized that God was using this for his benefit. So verse 6, 2 Corinthians 12, Paul says, Though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool. And he could have boasted, couldn't he have? Look at how many books of the Bible are recorded for us that Paul wrote, that God inspired, but Paul wrote the energy this man had of the travels that he went through, the congregations that he helped to establish, the beatings that he went through. He makes that list in another place. The times he spent in the deep, that would wig me out. You don't know what's under those waters. <laughs> The prisons he were in, they're nothing like prisons now. If you've ever been around one of the prisons we have today, they're, they're hotels compared to what Roman prisons were like. So he would have had reason to boast. All that God did through him, he says, Though I, For I will speak the truth, but I refrain, lest that anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears of me. I don't want someone to, to basically worship me. So, verse 7, lest I should be exalted above measure and by the abundance of the revelations that he had been given, God certainly used him in a very powerful way. He said, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. We're not told what that was. Some have speculated that it was his eyes. In one of his other letters, he says, here, see, I've written this in my own hand with such big letters. And they look at Acts 9 on his way to Damascus when he was struck down and God blinded his eyes. And some say, well, it could be the eyes. It doesn't have to be that because notice next. He says, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Maybe it could have been something like what we've read earlier, demons that would afflict him with something. I, we don't know. It's not possession. Please don't misunderstand. But Satan can poke at us all the time. He said, I realize that all of this was done, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And I don't think that was just three times in passing. Knowing Paul, he probably implored God deeply three times. But God gave him an answer, verse 9, My grace is sufficient to you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul then saw this as valuable because then he says, Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. What if God had not done this and Paul had gone off? He himself said that I need to pay attention lest I lose out on salvation. Maybe he would have believed his own press and gone down a path that he couldn't have come back from. But we know that illness doesn't have to involve sin here because look at how God used Paul. Would he have used him in such a powerful way if there was such deep standing sin that he was afflicted with this thing, whatever it was? By this point in Paul's life, he had written First and Second Thessalonians, the book of Galatians, Romans, these two letters to the Corinthians. And then after this point in time, he went on to write Hebrews, Philippians, Colossians, First and Second Timothy, Titus, Philemon. If illness is a manifestation of a terrible sin, how could God have used Paul in this way? When my dad was ordained a deacon in the early 1970s, one of his responsibilities, because there were so many people in the church at that time, that he was to be outside the anointing room door. He was to help organize the line <laughs> because there were so many people asking for anointing. By way of contrast, I've had conversations with people who are struggling with an illness or a health trial in their life, and I ask them if they've been anointed, and they look at me and I can see that they hadn't even thought about it. What's the point of any trial when we consider it from God's perspective? In this case, we're talking about healing. What's the point if we deal with a major health trial? God is primarily interested in each of us becoming like him. That's our calling. We're to overcome our carnal nature, our sinful way of looking at things. We're to replace it with godly character through the indwelling of his Holy Spirit. 
And so God will allow and use trials we face in our life to help us become more like him. That's the story of Job. That's the story of Hezekiah. That's the story of anyone that God has healed. Illness is just one way that he can use or might use for us to be taught something very important on a spiritual level. It's not wrong to use medicines for health afflictions that we face, but we need to make sure that we're not forgetting God's role in our healing. That's why I started where I did. God is our healer. There wasn't a medicine that those doctors could have given me and Jeff that would have changed any of what we went through. I'm convinced of that because they tried everything. We're also shown in Scripture that there are medicines, if you will, <laughs> that, that God encouraged to be recorded. In 1 Timothy 5, Paul talks to Timothy and encourages him in verse 23 to take some wine for his often infirmities. Timothy, it seemed, had a very sensitive disposition <laughs> physically. Stomach aches or whatever it happened to be, and Paul said, have a little wine. There is a, a medicinal element to wine a relaxation and other things that can come from that, relief of pain even. Proverbs 17, verse 22 talks about a merry heart is like medicine, that oftentimes our mental disposition can be just as important as literal medicine, and doctors don't like to talk about that, but they acknowledge that there's a huge uh, mental component to healing. If you're convinced you're going to die and you go into surgery, there's a higher likelihood that you will die. But in 2 Kings 20, we didn't read the next verse, but in 2 Kings 20, verse 7, Isaiah, oh, we did read it, I'm sorry. Isaiah told Hezekiah to take a poultice and put on that boil. But as I asked, was it the poultice that healed Hezekiah or God? What was important was the faith in God, first and foremost. And I believe the poultice was simply the physical action to acknowledge God's power and direction. Let's look at another interesting thing, in Ezekiel 47. In this section of Ezekiel, he's talking about a number of things in the future, uh, especially in regards to the millennium, that thousand-year reign of Christ, and many things that will happen before, during, and after. And in Chapter 47 here, he's talking about the healing waters that go out from the, the temple. The temple's going to be rebuilt in Jerusalem, the millennial time period. Christ will have his throne there. What's very interesting, if you read, especially Ezekiel, he has a number of prophecies that record that there's a stream, and this chapter talks about it as well. It begins at the temple, comes out from underneath the Holy of Holies. It goes out past the outer walls. And the further it goes away, the wider and deeper it gets. And so then in verse 12 here, it says, Along the bank of the river, as this thing proceeds out, it goes to the, the ocean, uh, it goes to the, um, what we call the Dead Sea. But it says, Along the bank of the river, on this side and on that, on both sides, all kinds of trees used for food, their leaves will not wither. There's a healing element to this water. Their fruit will not fail. They will bear, the trees will bear fruit every month. And it says, because the water, their water flows from the sanctuary, their fruit will be for food and their leaves for medicine. In the Hebrew, the word medicine is only used here, and it simply means healing. The leaves will be for healing. Now, in all these things, the primary element to keep in mind, again, is our spiritual healing. But this is the millennial time period that's being talked about here. There are still physical human beings on the face of the earth, and they will still have to go through things like illness, and they will still need to be healed. But it might even just be mental things that need to be healed. That's no small thing to consider either. People and nations will be healed. There's a great deal of symbology in that, isn't it? Christ talked about him being the living waters. We go through the symbology of baptism with water, don't we? The, the washing clean, all of these things. But in all of this, we have to acknowledge, too, that we're simply physical. Let's go back to Ecclesiastes 3. Ecclesiastes 3. 
Solomon understood this, and when you read Ecclesiastes, at times it can be very depressing. Because <laughs> he's just talking about how everything's temporary, everything's vanity. And if you're looking for value, meaning meaning, if you're looking for meaning of, of everything that we question in life, why do I exist, what happens after death, all these major questions, if you're looking that in a physical way, you will never find it. Because it's all temporary, isn't it? Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 20, we read here, it says that all go to one place, mankind, even the animals. All are from the dust and all return to the dust. You know, God knew what he was doing when he made us temporary, when he made us physical. It's astounding what he has created. That it works at all is amazing. All those chemicals making all those proteins and DNA and all that goes on on that chemical level. We breathe and we have life. We eat and we sustain that. But it's all dust, isn't it? Because if we're adamant that we're not going to be part of God's family the way we have to be to be in that family, then we'll simply go back to the dust. He repeats a similar thought in chapter 12, verse 7, that we return to the dust. Dust we are and to dust we will return. It's like that new car that you buy, and it's wonderful for the first two or three years, and then things start wearing out, don't they? <laughs> no matter how much money you spend on a car, they eventually wear out. Humanly, we're not much different. We wear out. What's really interesting is that from a genetic standpoint, it seems that there's a limit on how many times various genes can replicate. And they just stop. It's like there's a terminator on the end of that. We're not meant to live forever, and so we don't. And in fact, let's read Hebrews 9. It acknowledges here, Paul does, that, there, that we all face a time when we're going to die. We are not comfortable with thinking about that because we live in a linear existence, don't we? We're born, we develop, we grow, we mature, we take on knowledge, we age, and then we die. We don't like to think about the last part of that. In Hebrews 9 and verse 27 says, As it is appointed for men to die once, and then after that the judgment. We understand that this physical life is temporary. We see that understanding through the holy days, don't we? God is leading us to an understanding as we become more like him that we can have eternal life. But we're also to acknowledge that this life is temporary, and so we need to make the most of it now, even as we heard earlier. But let's look at Romans 8. Why do we deal with any of this? Romans 8 and verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. If this life is the be-all, end-all, if we think that it's only this life and we seek to satisfy the things of this life, we won't have eternal life. We will go back to dust. But it says if we, through the Spirit, seek to put to death those things, to change, to overcome, to become like God and His Son, we will live. Verse 14, For as many are as led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. This intimate relationship that we can have with God. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We have a spirit. This is one thing that science can't answer. Why is mankind so different from all the rest of what is in the world? There are animals that can communicate, but they don't communicate like we do. It's very limited. They don't express the way we do. They don't have emotions the way we do. They don't think to the level that we do and create and so forth. Because we have a portion of God's Spirit that allows us to connect with Him. Verse 17, if children then were heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs of Christ, if indeed, notice, we suffer with Him that we may be glorified together. We will face trials. It's not a question of if. <laughs> we will face trials. Sometimes those will be health trials. Do we look at those things as trials that will help us become, as it says here, glorified together with Christ? Or are they just sufferings that we go through? 
I remember as I was putting this sermon together, I remembered an, an older black lady in the Cincinnati congregation. Her name was Mrs. Postum. I had to ask my dad. I'd forgotten her name. She was an amazing older lady. She lived in the projects, really bad part of Cincinnati. But when she came to church, she was so happy to be there. All the kids loved her because she brought candy every week. <laughs> but she never complained. She never bemoaned her situation. And what made that even more impressive is that when I first remember her, when we started attending church, even at that point, she had such bad arthritis in her hands and her feet that, her, of course, her fingers were all twisted, but her toes were so bad that she could only wear tennis shoes and they would cut the toes out because her toes were so twisted she couldn't fit in the shoes without discomfort. Later, her arthritis got so bad that she could only move around in a wheelchair. Somebody had to push her. But she never wavered in her joy that she shared her desire to be at church. She was at every Sabbath, every activity, and we had a lot of activities back then. But she knew it was not about this body. We're here in Romans 8. Let's look at verse 28. Romans 8, verse 28. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God. And there are a lot of Christians that quote this, and they stop here, and then they wonder why things are not working together for good when they're faced with such hard things. Well, let's read the rest of it. To those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. What is our purpose? Is it to be comfortable and free of sickness? It's not that God desires that we're not, but that's not our purpose. It's nice when that's a part of our life, isn't it? Our purpose is to become like Him. And so verse 38, Paul says, For I am persuaded... He said, knowing that purpose, he says, that I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels or principalities, nor powers or things present or things to come, or height or depth, or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Will any trial separate us? That's the question, isn't it? If we're close enough to God, if we have the right vision and purpose, and desire for the future he wants for us, then we won't be. But I have seen people leave the church over sickness, major health trials, because they got tired. And I understand that. Chronic illness drains you, doesn't it? And yet this is what we're supposed to keep in mind. What would take us away from Christ? The ideal answer is nothing. And while we can look at things, any trial, as God not caring, it's hard for us to understand at times that it's actually the opposite. If he didn't care, we would just drift like the world is drifting. But because he does care, he wants us to have the character. He wants us to have his mind so that we can be in his family. We have a, a good, bad example. <laughs> in Second Chronicles 16, King Asa sought healing from the doctors, and Asa was not a good king, and it shows in that example. And I highlight it because God didn't kill Asa because he sought the doctors. I've heard people use this in the past to say we shouldn't go to doctors, we shouldn't go to the hospital. That's not the lesson there. God allowed Asa to die because Asa was awful. <laughs> he was rebellious. He was sinful. And the time he sought the doctor, the reason that was wrong was because he was seeking the doctors instead of God. Let's look at Matthew 9 and see why that's the case. Faith is a huge part of healing, and it's not just this nebulous, I hope God heals me sort of faith. It's a faith that no matter what we face, it's like where my parents got and realizing that God might allow us to die, and would they be okay with that, knowing that God would work the purpose out for the right thing? Matthew 9, in verse 27, 
When Christ departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, saying, Dave, Son of David, have mercy on us. When he had come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said, Do you believe that I am able to do this? This is the component of faith he was asking them. Because you can ask and just ask anybody, hoping that something will happen, right? But they're asking Christ, and he says here very directly, Do you believe I am able to do this? And they said, Yes. And it might seem like an easy thing to say, but let's continue. So he touched their eyes, and notice, he said, According to your faith, let it be to you. Now, depending on where we stand in our faith at any given moment, that might be a scary thing to ponder, isn't it? Would my faith prevent God from healing me? Well, maybe that's something to ask about. In this case, they had the faith because it says in verse 30, their eyes were opened and Jesus sternly warned them saying, see that no one knows it. And this is another one of those really interesting comments in scripture. How are you not going to notice two blind men that were blind that now aren't blind? I mean, who led them, verse 27, who led them to be able to follow Christ? They couldn't do that on their own. But nonetheless, it says, according to their faith, and they were healed. And my parents struggled to come to terms with my brother and me being so sick. They finally came to a point where they, they left it in God's hands. And it was not an act of resignation. It was rather an act of acceptance that... God had a purpose no matter what the outcome would be. And that's a hard thing to see sometimes, isn't it? But they had come to a point where they decided to trust in God no matter what the outcome. They knew that he would take care of things. And in a conversation probably some 20 years later with my mom, I asked what they thought of that. And she said that once they came to this point in their trial, that that's when Jeff and I slowly started to get better. It wasn't overnight. I was out of school most of the year. This happened in the fall. I didn't go back to school that year until around April. We had homework that was sent home and we were trying to keep on top of that stuff. But I was out of school that whole time. I remember going back to school and our junior high had three levels, no elevator, and I had to walk those steps and it took me a long time to walk those steps. I didn't have the strength for a long time. For Jeff, it was even longer than I was out of school. And to this day, there are blank years, huge sections of when he was very little, that he doesn't remember anything because the high fevers erased that memory. But once, I believe, God saw that my parents were willing to give it all up for him, then he began to answer their prayer. Looking back on that illness that Jeff and I had, it seems clear to me that it was not just a physical illness because the doctors never did determine what the problem was. For years after we got out of the hospital, my dad received copies of various lab reports, tests that were done. Virtually all of them said the same thing. They had no idea why we were sick. The other baffling matters to the doctors was that whatever it was that we had was not contagious. They thought because both of us had it that we were. And initially, even when we went to Children's Hospital there in Cincinnati, they had us in isolation. Everybody had to come in wearing face masks and gowns. They didn't know if we were contagious, if whatever we had was contagious. But it wasn't. They determined that it wasn't, which begs the question to me, how did we both get the same illness at the same time if it was not contagious? Sometimes our trials are to help build our faith, and sometimes... Our trials are to help build the faith of others. Let's conclude in 1 Peter 5. First Peter 5 and verse 10. Peter here writes, But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while. This is one of the things we struggle with at times, isn't it? Especially with illness. How long is a while. Is it within the hour, the day, the week, the month, the year? Is it within the decade or two? Is it within the course of our lifetime? Because God lives in eternity. What is a while? 
That's not the point, is it? It's what he wants to have come out of this. After you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. We must be careful we don't assume that someone is not righteous because they're going through a health trial, serious health trial. But there's a lot that we can consider in all of this. What's the bottom line? As we covered, God is our healer. But in the eternal scheme of things, our physical well-being is not paramount to God. It's what He can teach us, what we learn to be like in reflecting Him. God is our healer, but He may not want to heal us now so that those lessons can be learned. That He has our attention in those very tough times, doesn't He? Illness can come from sin, but not all illness is from sin. And it's certainly not wrong to take care of our bodies. That might include at times trips to doctors, but our lives have to be at first and foremost focused around God, having faith in Him and His way of life. For me, the important thing in considering this topic, any of this, any trial, is this. Are we growing spiritually? If not, then God might use illness to show us something spiritually important. Are we trusting in God to take care of us on all levels of our life, no matter what that ends up looking like? May we all have the spiritual healing we need to become like God so that we can be in His family for eternity.